Hello Physics 20s. In today's lesson, we are going to start on the second half of the unit on uniform circular motion and gravitation, where we are going to begin to focus on all things gravitation related. And specifically in this lesson, we're going to talk extensively about Newton's universal law of gravitation. Learning outcomes for today are to one, describe qualitatively and quantitatively Newton's law of universal gravitation. Two, explain qualitatively the principles pertinent to the Cavendish experiment used to determine the universal gravitational constant, capital G. And three, predict quantitatively differences in the weight of objects on different planets. And you'll practice number three in the assignment that's attached to this lesson. Now, just to set up the context of the lesson, so in the PowerPoint background, it shows some planets orbiting the sun. And what physicists or astronomers noticed is that planets in our solar system tend to orbit the sun in an elliptical manner. And an elliptical manner just means like a, a circle that's been squished. It's like an oval shape to it. Even though they knew that, and specifically We'll talk more about Kepler's laws of planetary motion, where Kepler's first law was about observing that planets in our solar system orbit the sun in an elliptical pattern. Physicists or astronomers didn't know why. It was simply an explanation that for, you know, like a reasonable period of time, they didn't really have any explanation as to why this was the case. Okay, so Isaac Newton comes along and he hypothesized, and we'll focus, instead of focusing on the planets going around the sun, we'll focus on the moon going around the earth. He hypothesized that the reason the moon goes around the earth in a circle is because of the gravitational force of attraction between the moon and the earth. So that gravitational force is responsible for this circular motion. If you took it a bit of a step larger, it would also be a gravitational force between the planets in our solar system and the sun that would be responsible for that elliptical motion. In either scenario, what Newton is predicting is that the force of gravity between these large planetary bodies is acting like a centripetal force. And looking at the moon going around the Earth, specifically the force of attraction that the Earth exerts on the Moon is a centripetal force. And as we know, centripetal forces are responsible for making objects move in a circle. We're going to have to modify our definition of the gravitational force just a little bit because so far in Physics 20, we've only dealt with the gravitational force with objects that are on or near the surface of the Earth. Well, now we have to like bring it to a much larger scale. Up until this point, like our old or previous definition of the force of gravity would be, it's just a force that pulls an object straight down towards the center of a planet. On every free body diagram we drew, we always drew FG pointing straight down an indication it is pointing towards the planet's center. A universal definition, when I say universal definition, we're now looking at the interaction of bodies that are outside of the earth. So like away from the surface of the earth. Universally, we can define the force of gravity as being a force of attraction between all matter in the universe. So as you like sit uh, perhaps in your desk right now, there's a force of attraction between you and your computer screen, you and a pencil on your desk, between you and the earth, between you and the sun, between you and Jupiter's moon Io. As long as objects have mass, meaning that's what an object is, an object has mass, there is a force of attraction that's always trying to pull them together. That's our universal definition. Newton's universal law of gravitation enables us to calculate this force. So you might be wondering, okay, if there's a force between like me and all these objects in my room right now, why are these objects not flying towards me? Well, there's a good reason for this, and we can explain it just by looking at Newton's universal law of gravitation. All right, here's the law states. 
the magnitude, so we're not going to worry about the direction here, the magnitude of the gravitational force, Fg, between two objects is calculated by the following equation. Now, just to illustrate this, let's say we have two objects. We have M1 and M2. To calculate this force, the magnitude, we have the magnitude of the gravitational force is equal to capital G, M1, M2, divided by R squared. Where M1 and M2 represent the mass of each object. For the equation to work, we do need the units to be in kilograms for the mass. R, and here's another area where you have to be really, really careful. R is the distance from the center of object one to the center of object two. The reason we need to be careful about this is because when we're dealing with large planets, oftentimes we only know the distance from like the surface of one object to the surface of another one. That is not what the R value represents. The R value is the distance from the center of one object to the center of another one. And that needs to be expressed in units of meters. Capital G is what we call the gravitational constant, and we'll talk more about how this was determined in a moment. It has a really ugly value. So we have capital G is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meter squared divided by kilogram squared. That equation or that, that constant is on your formula sheet. So it is not one you need to memorize, although we're going to use it so much that you'll end up memorizing it really, really quickly, believe it or not. Now, going back to my initial uh, question where I said, well, if there's a, a gravitational force of attraction between me and every single thing in the universe, then why doesn't, for example, my stapler on the other side of the room fly across and hit me in the head? Well, you have to remember there's forces of attraction between the stapler and other objects too. If you look at the equation, the force gets really big the bigger the masses are. So the bigger the mass of object one, the bigger the mass of object two, the bigger the force of gravity is going to get. There's a direct relationship between Fg and M1 and M2. The mass of the Earth is huge. So the mass of the Earth dominates in every single one of those forces where it just ends up making the overall net force acting on our objects pointing just straight down towards the center of the Earth. So it's not a big deal. Okay? The stapler is not going to hit you in the head. You don't need to worry. Small note, this kind of is an application of Newton's third law of motion. So if object one exerts a gravitational force on object two, then object two exerts an equal and opposite gravitational force back on number one. We drew vectors to represent this. So the gravitational force is always a force of attraction. Therefore, M1 would be attracted towards M2, and M2 would be attracted towards M1. So believe it or not, right now, like the force that the Earth exerts on me, I exert an equal and opposite force back on the Earth. Now, of course, the Earth doesn't move, and we can justify this by looking at Newton's second law of motion. So the second law of motion tells us that our acceleration is equal to our net force divided by m. Our net force, we could say, is just the gravitational force, so it's a constant. Therefore, we can just look at the inverse relationship between acceleration and your mass. So because the Earth has a humongous mass, okay, large mass, its acceleration is like really, really tiny. And because we have a much smaller mass, our acceleration is quite a bit bigger with both the Earth and me being subjected to the exact same net force. Could you just talk about an experiment, though, that determined this value for capital G? The experiment called the Cavendish experiment. Here's the apparatus of the experiment, and uh, I'll, I'll try to explain to you how this works. Okay, so 
what we have is we have a couple of large spheres. I have M2. They're lead balls. So let's call them spheres. M2. These ones are connected to a bar, and this bar is fixed to the ground. So lead balls M1 or lead, lead balls M2 are attached to a bar that is fixed on the ground that cannot move. Attached to the ceiling, I have a torsional wire. When I say torsional wire, it's just like a wire that if you twist it, it tries to go back to its untwisted position. Hanging on that torsional wire is a mirror. Below the mirror, I have another little bar that this time connects two different masses. I have mass one and I have same thing, another mass one. The other thing I have is I said laser light. It could just be like a, a, a single beam of light. Uh, it doesn't have to be a laser. Uh, so you have like a beam of light. It strikes this mirror and then it reflects back off to, I said a sensor, although we could just like measure its position that it hits back. Okay, now in terms of how this works, I'm not going to go into like two specifics about it because uh, we need to know a little bit more about dealing with the torsional constant of the wire, which is not something we get into in physics, uh, physics 20. Okay, so let's look at this side of the, 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 uh, the bar of M1. There is a gravitational force that wants M1 to go towards M2. So we'll call that FG. So M1 is attracted to M2. On the other end of the bar, there's a gravitational force exerted on M1 that also wants to make it go towards M2. So we have another gravitational force. What this gravitational force is going to do is it's going to cause this torsional wire to twist. It's going to make this bar start to twist. And I believe if we looked at this from a top view perspective, the direction this thing would rotate from a top view perspective would be in a direction that is clockwise. So M1 is going to inch a bit closer to M2 on this side. Same thing on the other side. M2 is going to inch a little bit closer to M2. What's going to change is as this barbell starts to rotate, the angle at which the laser hits the mirror and bounces back, it's going to progressively change. What Kevin just did is basically, he just set this up, he let the mirror rotate, and apparently it rotates really, 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 really slow, because this gravitational force is super small. And by measuring how this angle is changing and knowing information about like the wire, specifically the torsional constant of the wire, he was able to determine the gravitational constant. And that's as much as I'll say about the actual experiment. For the physics 20 level, we don't need to know anything more about the mathematical details, aside from just knowing the apparatus, how the apparatus kind of moves around, and then what are what's the important constant we got out of this. Okay, so Cavendish calculated the magnitude of the gravitational force between these two lead balls, M1 and M2. And then also by knowing information regarding the torsional constant of the wire and how the light reflects off that mirror, he got the gravitational constant. So that's the significance of the experiment is it gave us a value for the gravitational constant of the universe, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meter squared per kilogram squared. However, there's another result that can be obtained once we know what capital G is. Once we know what capital G is, we can then immediately figure out what the mass of the earth is. This is also a value on your formula sheet. The mass of the earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. So think of it like this. Like how would I figure out what M2 is? Well, we could do this separately from like the Cavendish experiments. For example, let's say we have like the earth M2 and we have like an object M1. Universal gravitation tells me that FG is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. 
So presumably we know the mass of M1. We know the gravitational constant from the Cavendish experiment. R be the distance from the center of the object at the center of the Earth. So we'd need to know what the radius of the Earth is as well. And then FG would just be the weight of my object, which we could also determine. If I know these four variables and the only one that remains is M2, and then you can figure out what the mass of the Earth is. So it's just a, it's just a consequence of a, a variable you can, you can calculate the instant you know what the gravitational constant of the universe is. So uh, to, I'd say like directly, you get the gravitational constant from the Cavendish experiment and more so indirectly afterwards, you can also calculate the mass of the Earth. Example problem. I have a 100 kilogram astronaut is floating 12,000 meters above the surface of the Earth. And I wanna calculate the magnitude of the gravitational force of attraction between the astronaut and the Earth. I just wanted to point out that our one equation for calculating the gravitational force so far, Fg is equal to Mg. Well, the problem is we can't use this to calculate the gravitational force on the astronaut because we don't know what G is. If the astronaut was on the surface of the Earth, G would be 9.81 meters per second squared, but they're not. So we don't know what the acceleration due to gravity is at their, their location. If we did, then that equation would be totally valid to use to calculate the gravitational force between the astronaut and the Earth. Okay, I'm going to draw a picture because you have to be very careful in how we like calculate a certain variable in this problem. Okay, so let's say that we have the, here's the surface of the Earth. Here's the center. And let's put the astronaut up here. So we'll say the astronaut has the mass of M1. And we'll say the Earth has the mass of M2. What the problem tells me is it tells me, and I'll do this in a different color. It tells me how far they are above the surface of the Earth. That's what we call altitude. Okay, so my altitude is 12,000 meters. However, according to uh, the universal gravitation equation, we're looking at the distance from the center of one object to the center of another one. So what we need to do is we need to know what this distance is. We'll call that R. That's what R is, the, the, from the center of M1 to the center of M2. The object, by the way, is so small that the distance from the center of M1 to its surface, like from the astronaut center of mass to the outside is so small that we don't really care about that, but we do need to care about the Earth having size. Okay, so what would R be equal to? Well, it would be the altitude plus this missing length. This missing length is the radius of the Earth. This is also on the formula sheet. So you have the radius of the Earth is 4.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. Okay, you don't need to memorize that one. Just like the mass of the Earth and the gravitational constant are both on the formula sheet. Okay, now let's go ahead and calculate this. So we want the magnitude of the gravitational force, Fg. And by the way, if you don't want to write down the magnitude of the vector, we can just write it down as Fg like this. That would be equal to G, M1, M2, all divided by R squared. Okay, let's plug the numbers in. So capital G is the gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared, multiplied by the mass of object one, which is the astronaut, so that's uh, 100 kilograms. M2 is the mass of the Earth. Again, that's on the formula sheet, and that value is 5.97.
times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And then we need to divide this by R. Well, the value of R would just be these two numbers added together. So we could write down 12,000 meters plus 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters, all squared. If you wanted to, you could do the R calculation separately and then plug it into the equation if uh, you wanted to break the steps up a bit. Okay, if you plug this in, and make sure you square that denominator. Uh, I get a value that is 978 newtons. Okay, now let's go to part B. Part B says, if the astronaut's mass is tripled and the distance between the astronaut and the center of the Earth is halved, determine the new magnitude of the gravitational force between the astronaut and the Earth. All right, we haven't dealt with a problem like this since the very start of the course when we looked at variations in equations. Now, questions like this are going to start to pop up a lot more frequently now. So I'll review how you do one of these problems. Okay, here's what we know. We know that Fg is G M1 M2 over R squared, and that's equal to 978 newtons. Okay, that's what Fg is before we make all the changes. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to calculate a new value of Fg, so Fg nu. And I'm going to have to replace variables in the equation to properly do this. Okay, so do I do anything to capital G? No, you can't. It's the gravitational constant of the universe. Now, it says the mass of object 1 is tripled. So instead of writing down M1, we're going to write down 3M1. Triple the mass is just 3M1. M2 is the mass of the Earth. It does not change. And then it tells me that R is cut in half, which would be R divided by two, all squared. By the way, I should point out that oh, this makes no sense. If you, did, if you did cut this distance in half, the astronaut would actually be located somewhere in the Earth's core or somewhere like within the actual Earth's surface. I don't know if it's the core, but somewhere in there. In other words, they'd be dead. Okay. We need to expand this equation a little bit. So I'm going to bring the three out in front. So it'd be three G M one M two divided by, and I want to apply the exponent here to both the R and to the two. So this would turn into R squared over four. If you get confused with the double denominator, because there's a double fraction, we can rewrite it like this. We can say three G M one m2 divided by take the big fraction symbol and replace it with the the standard division symbol and we have r squared over four then i would have fg nu would be three g m1 m2 times Dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiplying by its reciprocal. So the reciprocal of r squared over 4 would be 4 over r squared. And this would then give me fg nu is equal to 12 g m1 m2 over r squared. Okay. After you simplify, there's two things you want to look for. One, you want to look for some kind of numerical coefficient that's sitting in front of your original equation. And two, you want to look for the equation that you started with. So the equation I started with was this one. Fg is gm1 m2 over r squared, which we know is equal to 978 newtons. And I have gm1 m2 over r squared right here. Okay, the number in front of this equation, 
tells you the factor in which the gravitational force would increase by. So as a result of doing these changes, my gravitational force would increase by a factor of 12. But since we know what the original value of the gravitational force is, we can go ahead and we can calculate this. Okay, I'm gonna replace gm1 m2 over r squared with just fg. So my new value of fg would be equal to 12 times the old value. The old value of fg is 978 newtons. Okay, let's calculate this. We're going to keep it at three significant digits because this factor doesn't have any uncertainty about it. We're completely certain that is the factor in which it increases by. And when I do this, I would get a value of 1.17 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Not surprising if the astronaut is much closer to the center of the Earth, the gravitational force would be a lot larger. All right, that's it for this lesson. And you can complete the assignment called Universal Gravitation to practice some problems similar to the one you saw in the example problems and some other scenarios as well. And I will talk to you in the next lesson.